Lynette, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. you. <laughs> Today, we're pleased to present a proposed order to preserve the open internet. As my colleagues and I will explain, this order would establish three basic rules to preserve the open internet. They are transparency, no blocking, and no unreasonable discrimination. These straightforward rules are grounded in broadly accepted internet principles and tailored to differing technologies. Collectively, they protect and empower consumers and innovators, help ensure that the internet continues to flourish as an engine of commerce, creativity, and civic engagement and provide clarity for broadband providers. By ensuring that no one controls access to the Internet, they cement the credibility of the United States as we continue to advocate for other nations to let the open Internet flourish within their own borders. Seated with me this morning in the order in which they will present are David Tannenbaum, Special Counsel in the Office of General Counsel, who will explain how the proposed order is grounded in Commission precedent and long-standing principles of Internet openness. Paul Dessa, Chief of the Office of Strategic Planning and Policy Analysis, who will explain how the order would promote investment and innovation. Ruth Milkman, Chief of the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, who will explain how the rules will apply to mobile broadband services. And Austin Schlick, the Commission's General Counsel, who will discuss enforcement of the uh, discuss enforcement and the Commission's legal authority. The draft before you is the product of extraordinary efforts by bureaus and offices across the entire Commission. Time does not permit me to mention by name the dozens of talented and dedicated staff who contributed, but please know that this draft reflects a tremendous amount of hard work from some very special people who are listed on the screen. Mr. Chairman uh, and Commissioners, uh, as you know, uh, the Commission has long recognized that open communications networks spur innovation and investment to the benefit of consumers, competition, and economic growth. Over the course of many years, in many contexts, and especially through a series of decisions over the last five years, the Commission has maintained its commitment to the openness that facilitated the birth and the incredible growth of the Internet. In 2005, the Commission unanimously adopted an Internet policy statement that sought to protect the rights of consumers to access the lawful Internet content of their choice and the freedom to use the applications, services, and devices of their choosing, subject to reasonable network management. The Commission later made these principles enforceable in the context of telephone company mergers, as well as in the 700 megahertz C-block spectrum auction. The Commission adopted these measures with a shared understanding that its authority and statutory obligations extend to ensuring open broadband networks. And these measures reflected long-standing principles of openness on Internet access networks, principles that are the foundation upon which the Internet was built. Entrepreneurs, investors, and innovators depend on these principles, and major broadband providers have committed publicly to preserving the Internet's openness. At the same time, however, there have been incidents, some of which have led to commission action, where broadband providers have blocked or degraded lawful Internet traffic without their actions to consumers. The rules proposed in the order before you are consistent with the Commission's history of protecting the Internet's openness from such threats. Since 1995, venture capital funds have invested almost $250 billion in Internet-related industries. The historical openness of the Internet that David has just described has made this massive investment possible by eliminating barriers to innovation and by giving even the smallest businesses access to national and global markets. Many online companies have gone from ideas to multi-billion dollar enterprises in just a few years, and the entrepreneurs who launched these companies didn't need to ask anyone's permission. They just had to prove their ability to meet customers' needs. Meanwhile, thanks to the ever-growing demand for access to innovative online content and services, home broadband adoption has risen from just 3% in 2000 to over 60%. This growth has given broadband providers the opportunity to earn a fair return on the billions of dollars that they have invested every year in developing and deploying technologies to meet Internet users' escalating bandwidth needs. The rules that we propose today have been crafted to preserve this cycle of innovation and investment, even as the market for broadband is changing. 
Online services can present competitive threats to broadband providers' profits in adjacent businesses such as, vo such as voice and video. The possibility that providers could interfere with the flow of internet traffic in ways that violate hierarchical principles creates unnecessary uncertainty for online businesses and their investors. Tactics that are in the short-term interest of individual providers could have harmful effects on the as a whole, and once adopted, new network management business practices could become difficult to reverse. By codifying the basic principles under which most broadband providers and online companies have long operated, the rules that we propose today will bring increased certainty to this vital sector of the U.S. economy while preserving the flexibility broadband providers need to keep improving their networks. Broadband providers, online businesses, and investors will all know what to expect under these rules because they largely reflect the way the Internet works now. Among the greatest beneficiaries of this increased certainty will be startups and small businesses. Some of them will become our country's next success stories, bringing new products to market, creating jobs, and fueling demand for new rounds of innovation and investment in broadband infrastructure. basic rules that are grounded in broadly accepted internet principles as well as the Commission's prior decisions. I will describe the proposed rules tailored to fixed technologies and Ruth Milton will discuss the proposed rules tailored to mobile broadband. The first rule is transparency. Broadband providers must disclose their network management practices and the performance characteristics and commercial terms of their broadband services. This rule will ensure that consumers and innovators have the information they need to understand the capabilities of broadband services while giving providers flexibility in how they deliver that information. The second rule prohibits blocking. Providers of fixed broadband internet access service may not block lawful content, applications, services, or non-harmful devices. This rule is based on the first three internet policy statement principles and consolidates three separate rules that were published in the notice of proposed rulemaking in this proceeding. The no blocking rule bars a provider of fixed broadband from charging providers of content, applications, services, or devices simply for delivering traffic to or from the broadband providers and user customers. The third rule prohibits unreasonable discrimination. Providers of fixed broadband internet access services may not unreasonably discriminate in transmitting lawful network traffic. The record in this proceeding convinced us that there are some forms of differential treatment of traffic that are beneficial and some that are harmful. So an unreasonable discrimination standard is preferable to the bright line non-discrimination rule the Commission proposed in the notice. The rules are subject to reasonable network management. A network management practice is reasonable if it is appropriate and tailored to achieving a legitimate network management purpose, taking into account the particular network architecture and technology of the broadband and internet access service. Finally, the order acknowledges the category of specialized services which share capacity with broadband internet access service over, over providers' last mile facilities. There may be benefits for consumers from these services, but they also present an opportunity for broadband providers to exert greater control over consumers' internet experience. The proposed order provides that rather than taking action at this time, the Commission would observe market developments to verify that specialized services promote investment, innovation, competition, and consumer benefits without undermining or threatening the open internet. Openness is as important for mobile broadband networks as for other broad broadband platforms. Consumers are using mobile broadband at an accelerating pace and access to mobile broadband is becoming increasingly essential to innovation, investment, and freedom of expression. As a result of move toward openness by wireless providers, users are gaining greater access to diverse applications, content, and services, and have more opportunities to use compatible third-party devices. At the same time, there have been instances of mobile providers blocking third-party applications, and concerns have been raised about inadequate transparency. There are, however, important differences between mobile and fixed broadband. Mobile broadband is an earlier stage platform and is quickly evolving. The significant and fast moving change in mobile broadband counsels for a measured approach, an approach that fosters openness without triggering unforeseen consequences in this highly dynamic area. We therefore tailor certain of the open internet principles to mobile broadband, 
requiring compliance with transparency rule and a basic no blocking rule. First, the transparency rule applicable to mobile is the same one applicable to fixed broadband providers and directs mobile broadband providers to disclose their third party device and application certification procedures and clearly explain criteria for any restrictions on use of their networks. Second, the order establishes that mobile broadband providers may not block access to lawful websites. The rule enables to access content of their choosing while allowing mobile providers to manage their networks. Third, the order prohibits mobile broadband providers from blocking apps that compete with their voice and video telephony services. This provision is intended to address situations in which mobile providers have the strongest incentives to limit internet openness to advantage their core businesses. However, the order specifies that the no blocking rule does not generally apply to mobile broadband providers engaged in the operation of app stores. As with the rules that apply to fixed broadband, all of these rules allow mobile providers to engage in reasonable network management. And finally, the order expresses the Commission's commitment to continue to monitor and solicit input on further developments, including the effects of the open internet rules and the upper 700 megahertz C block spectrum conditions. The proposed order encourages private resolution of disputes about internet openness but it also establishes enforcement mechanisms to address situations in which a private resolution is not possible. Under the order, consumers can submit informal complaints to the Commission using the FCC.gov website without a filing fee. In addition, after giving 10 days notice to the broadband provider, any person may file a formal complaint alleging a violation of the open internet rules. Complaints may be expedited on the Enforcement Bureau's so-called rocket procedures. The Commission also has the option of itself initiating investigations and enforcement actions. I'll now turn to the Commission's legal authority to adopt these open internet rules. As the Supreme Court has said, Congress gave the Commission a mandate to conform its rules to the dynamic aspects of the communications industry. The open internet rules respond to that challenge, and the Office of General Counsel is satisfied that the Commission has statutory authority to adopt them. Section 706 of the Telecommunications Act of 1996 directs the Commission to encourage the deployment on a reasonable and timely basis of advanced telecommunications capability to all Americans. The history of the 1996 Act, Commission precedent and case law, including the D.C. Circuit's recent Comcast BitTorrent case, are all consistent with the view that Section 706 directs the Commission to take actions that, one, involve interstate and foreign communication by wire or radio, two, encourage broadband deployment to all Americans, and three, promote local telecommunications competition or remove barriers to infrastructure investment. The rules before you meet all three requirements. The Commission also is charged with protecting competition and consumers of telecommunications services. For instance, it has authority to ensure that over-the-top internet voice services, VoIP, can develop as a rival to traditional phone services. The Commission likewise must safeguard interconnection between telephone customers and VoIP users. Open Internet rules help to do these things. The Commission additionally flows from its responsibilities to oversee broadcast and advanced video competition. Blocking or disadvantaging online offerings limits the ability of television radio broadcasters to offer their programming over the Internet. Direct broadcast satellite provider, providers similarly depend on the Internet to supplement their video programming services. Interference with Internet delivery limits their ability to compete and telephone companies in providing subscription video services. The Commission has statutory duties to prevent these harms. Finally, fixed and mobile wireless services use radio spectrum that the Commission licenses. The Commission can and must place conditions on licenses to serve the public interest and open internet rules further this goal as well. In short, open internet rules promote efficient nationwide communications, which as Section 1 of the Communications Act says, is the core mission Congress gave this Commission. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, as you have heard, this order would ensure the continued openness of the Internet that we enjoy today. It would promote the interests of consumers, investors, broadband providers, and innovators with three basic rules that are grounded in the Commission's precedent and existing legal authority. For all the reasons that my colleagues and I have given, we recommend that you accept this item and we request editorial privileges. Thank you. Well, thanks to uh, uh, each of you and, uh, and all the others who worked on this for your incredibly uh, hard and excellent work. Let's uh, proceed to comments from the bench.
Commissioner Copps? Thank you. I uh, hope in years to come, as we look back on this day, we do so with an ability to see it as an important turning point in the struggle to ensure the continued openness of the Internet against the potential of powerful gatekeeper control. On numerous fronts, fronts in the open Internet order before us today, the Commission is taking strides forward. In others, I pray that our sometimes of caution and will not undermine the spirit of the order we are adopting. The Internet was born on openness, it thrived on openness, and it will achieve its full potential only through continued openness. It is my fervent desire that with this order we start to write the next chapter in the great Internet success story, one of continued openness, innovation without needing to seek permission from anyone, and expanded access for all Americans. We can't afford allowing special interests to relegate the awesome opportunity created power of the open Internet into the sad history of what might have been. Permitting gigantic corporations, in many cases monopoly, duopoly, broadband Internet access service providers to exercise unfettered control over access to the Internet not only creates risks to technological innovation and to economic growth, but it poses a real threat to freedom of speech and to the future of our democracy. Increasingly, our national conversation, our source for news and information, our knowledge of one another will depend upon the Internet. Our future town square will be paved with broadband bricks. It must be accessible to all, not handed over to a handful of gatekeepers who can control our access. As I have long argued, and as many students of the medium have written, previous telecommunications and media technologies also conceived in openness, eventually fell victim to consolidated control by a few powerful interests, fell victim to speculative mania by investors, and fell victim to mistaken government policies which assumed that wise public policy was no public policy. We are supposed to learn from history. Too often, we do not. Increasingly, the private interests who control our 21st century information infrastructure resemble those who seize the master switch, as Tim Wu's new book calls it, of the last century's communications networks. In 2003, I cautioned, somewhat dramatically perhaps, but not terribly inaccurately, that the, quote, Internet may be dying because entrenched interests were positioning themselves to control the Internet's choke points, end quote. I called then, as I have repeatedly since, for clear rules to maintain openness and freedom on the Internet and to fight discrimination over ideas and content and technologies. Two years later, I was able to convince my colleagues to, at a minimum, adopt an Internet policy statement that contain the basic rights of Internet end users to access lawful content, run applications and services, connect devices to the Internet and the network, and to enjoy the benefits of competition. Now, at long last, we adopt at least some concrete rules to prevent gatekeepers from circumventing the openness that made the Internet the Internet and from stifling innovation, investment, and job creation. All we need to do is look at our history at the FCC as a cautionary tale. It wasn't all long ago, at least when you're at my age, I guess, that one network, AT&T, ran the whole show. AT&T had the power to decide how the network would be used. When innovators showed up at the door with ideas and new technologies, they were often greeted with a usually courteous but always quick, go away. For a long time, the FCC fully supported this type of network, and in fact served as its protector. It was thought that only through comprehensive control by a single company could the quality and the safety and scale like an economies of the network be guaranteed. Bigger was better, and uniformity and stability were thought to be worth the price of lost opportunity for innovation and consumer benefits. All of this began to change in the late 1960s when an innovator called Carter Electronics Corporation developed a device that connected mobile radio telephone systems to the wireline network. This device, called a Carter phone, a cradle into which a regular handset was placed, and it converted voice signals to radio signals, 
without the need for a direct electrical connection. But the entrenched incumbent claimed that allowing this innovative and foreign attachment would bring down the entire system. Why? Because the entrenched incumbent didn't build it, didn't sell it, and didn't control it. Sound familiar? Over the complaints of powerful special interests, the Commission worked up enough courage to change tack, stand up to the net gatekeeper, and do the right thing, requiring the network operator to permit attachment of this new application to the existing network. In spite of all the monopolist alarm bells that this decision meant the end of network quality and the end of reliable service as we knew it, just the opposite came to pass. The idea of having a network that couldn't discriminate against in innovators who wanted to improve it finally began to break the chokehold that the gatekeeper had on the system. Years after the Carter Phone decision, as we entered the early days of the Internet age, the Commission reaffirmed its policy of openness and competition by protecting freedom on both the access layer and the architectural layer of the Internet. In the computer inquiries, earlier commissions mandated that common carriers that own transmission pipes used to access the Internet must offer those pipes on non-discriminatory terms to independent Internet service providers, among others. Through these decisions, the Commission fostered competition by ensuring that consumers could reach independent providers. Congress then moved in the Telecommunications Act of 1996 to protect the architectural layer. Congress said that local telephone companies with choke point control of physical infrastructures would have to unbundle their transmission networks. Sadly, these policies were, in fairly short order, decimated by the two commissions that served here between 2001 and 2009. Over my strenuous objections and those of my colleague John Nettlestein, the FCC took American consumers on a dangerous deregulatory ride, moving the transmission component of broadband outside of the statutory framework Congress had created to apply to telecommunications carriers. When those commissions stopped treating advanced telecommunications as telecommunications, they relegated American competitiveness to the sidelines. I don't like to see my country on the sidelines, and neither do most Americans. And remember, this was a major flip-flop from the historic and successful approach of requiring discrimination in our communications networks. Because of the errors of those previous commissions, the court told us earlier this year that the legal framework upon which the FCC built its action against Comcast for disrupting peer-to-peer -peer traffic was inadequate. Since the decision in Comcast, the good ship FCC has found itself adrift without the tools needed to keep even the most basic consumer protections afloat in today's communications networks. Today we finally try to patch the hole left by the Comcast decision by adopting certain rules to preserve the openness of the Internet. To be clear, we do not anchor ourselves on what I believe to be the best legal framework, nor have we crafted rules as strong as I would have liked. But with action, we do nonetheless appear to steer ourselves back toward a better course. I had hoped that we would move full throttle to restore the kind of policies that had worked in the past. I wanted to put those eight years of public policy aberration, some included, dare call them, years of abdication, totally behind us. So I pushed pushed it as hard as I could to get broadband telecommunications back where they belonged under Title II of our enabling statute, where hard-won consumer-friendly protections that had been built up over many, many years provide a framework under which business could do its job of building and managing this great communications enterprise, making handsome profits in the process, while operating within a public policy framework, giving them certainty and giving consumers the protections they needed and deserved. I wanted to go back to that balancing act that had generally worked for so many years for the common good. So yes, I continue to believe that a reassertion of our Title II authority would have provided the surest foundation for future Commission action. And I note with interest that the Commission's reclassification docket will remain open. There is more that I would have liked in this order. I would have preferred a general ban to discourage broadband providers from engaging in pay-for-priority, prioritizing the traffic of those with deep pockets 
who would consign the rest of us to a slower second-class Internet. I also believe we should have done more to stop loopholes from the definition of broadband Internet access service to prevent companies falsely claiming they are not broadband companies from slipping through. We made some improvements on the definition, but I still have some worries. I also argued for real parity between fixed and mobile, read wireline and wireless technology. After all, the Internet is the Internet, no matter how you access it. And the millions of citizens going mobile nowadays for their Internet and the entrepreneurs creating innovative wireless content applications and services should have the same freedoms and, and protections as those in the wired context. I had other areas of concern about something less than a bright line non-discrimination rule, keeping reasonable network management within bounds, and the substitution of monitoring for the certainty of enforcement in too many areas. So in my book, today's action could and should have gone further. Going as far as I would have liked was not, however, in the cards. The simpler and easier course for me at that point would have been dissent, and I considered that very, very seriously. But it became ever more clear to me that without some action today, the wheels of network neutrality would grind to a screeching halt for at least the next two years. So, reserving the right to dissent throughout, I spent the past three weeks in intensive discussions with all interested parties about how we might be able to do something to ensure the continued openness of the Internet and to put consumers, not big phone or big cable, in control of our online experiences. In the end, I believe we made some progress. Not so much as I had hoped, but more, I think, than some people expected. The language and the order that we will hopefully approve today moves the item, in my mind, from unacceptable to something in which I can concur, and that is what I intend to do. Among the many improvements to the order we achieve, we now at least conclude that pay-for-priority arrangements would generally violate our no unreasonable discrimination rule. We have also explicitly changed the text of the definition of broadband Internet access service to close the loophole that, while protecting residential customers, would have jeopardized the open Internet rights of small businesses educational institutions and libraries. We insisted on providing greater context to the definition so that broadband companies cannot easily evade the open Internet protections. We have expanded our transparency requirements to give, give consumers the information they need to make informed choice by requiring disclosure on the broadband provider's website and also at the point of sale. In discussing the No Unreasonable Discrimination Standard, we put particular emphasis on keeping control in the hands of users and preserving an application-blind network, a key part of making the Internet the innovative platform that it is today. Given the importance of the open Internet, we have also provided for rocket docket expedited treatment to address consumer complaints. Rules on the books are simply a tool waiting to be wielded unless the Commission makes a priority of enforcing them. While it is no secret that I would have liked to see more in the full section of today's order, I believe the improvements we have made can start us on a path toward full parity with fixed broadband. After all, we clearly recognize today in the item that there is one Internet which should remain open for consumers and innovators alike although it may be accessed through different technologies and services, and that's a quote. More narrowly, we have managed to better refine the actions we do take today. For example, we clarify that a wireless broadband provider cannot block applications that compete with not only its own competitive voice and telephony applications, but also with those in which it has an unattributable interest. Separate <clears throat> and apart from today's order, we as a commission must recognize that we have much urgent business to address to ensure a truly competitive mobile broadband environment, including resolving the pending proceedings related to early termination fees, handset ex exclusivity arrangements, interoperability in the 700 megahertz band, and data roaming, to name some of the pending decisions this commission needs to make. 
But it's not the job of just the FCC or government writ large or just consumers and citizens or just innovative entrepreneurs to keep our infrastructure open and dynamic. It is the job of all of us. Why is this so important? Because we have in our grasp now the most powerful and promising communications technology in all of history. If we allow this opportunity creating technology, the freedom and the openness that it needs to reach its full potential, we can prepare our kids for a future that our country is finding more and more challenging. We will give our schools powerful new tools to educate us you know, alike. We will be able to deploy these tools to improve our health, decrease our energy dependence, and create opportunities for whole communities that are being left behind in this new century. Rural communities, the inner cities, minorities, Indian country, and those with disabilities. The internet has to be accessible to all, responsible, responsive to all, and affordable to all. That's what this country worked for and largely achieved in building out electricity and plain old telephone service to all our citizens. It is what we need to work for with our 21st century broadband infrastructure. If vigilantly and vigorously implemented by this commission, and if upheld by the courts, today's order could represent an important milestone in the ongoing struggle to safeguard what I refer to as the awesome power of the Internet. While I cannot wholeheartedly vote to approve the order, I will not block it by voting against it. It is a first step in the right direction, not that first dirty step my newest grandchild will soon take, but at least forward, if somewhat hesitant, movement. Today's majority was crafted by discussion, respectful consideration of one another's thoughts, and give and take. I will come a little more give, but I suppose the chairman might see it a little bit differently. In any event, I thank him for his engagement and for his commitment. I pay special tribute to my colleague, Commissioner Mignon Clyburn. We shared many of the same concerns, I think it's fair to say, and her thoughtful and creative work, along with her heartfelt commitment to make this item work for consumers, by which she means all consumers, had a lot to do with making this a better order. Finally, I want to express a deep sense of gratitude to staff who worked to make this item better. Mine was great aspect of this endeavor. John Drusty and Margaret McCarthy worked creatively and tirelessly into the wee hours of many nights and through some awfully long weekends. So too Commissioner Clyburn's excellency, Dave Grimaldi and Angie Cronenberg. I know many folks in the office sacrificed similarly, especially Rick Kaplan, Zach Katz, and Eddie Lazarus. Really dozens of people in the bureaus worked to mightily too, and I thank them all. Thanks apart, though, our job does not end today. We haven't finished any race here. We haven't guaranteed an open Internet going forward. We will have, I suspect, a lot of new roads to build and some other roads, even ones that we left into today's order that may require some repaving and repair before long. If that happens, I hope we will be fast off the mark to do whatever needs to be done. So, better than lapsing into a year of post-game armchair analysis or impugning motivations and all the rest, let's instead go to work on the job at hand, because our challenge really is nothing short of historic. It is to ensure that the liberating potential of our 21st century communications tools are used to provide the opportunities our citizens, all of our citizens, require to be fully productive citizens of a fully productive country. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Cobbs. Dr. Dell. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your solicitousness regarding uh, throughout this whole uh, proceeding. In the spirit of the holidays and with uh, goodwill towards all, I will present a condensed version of a more in-depth statement, the entirety of which I respectfully request be included in this report and order. 
At the outset, I would like to thank the selfless and tireless work of all career public servants here at the Commission who have worked long on this project. And Sharon, thank you very much for putting up those names. It looked like the, uh, the credits for a Cecil B. DeMille movie there with a cast of thousands. Although I strongly disagree with this order, all of us should recognize and appreciate uh, that you have spent time away from your families as you've worked through weekends, the holidays of Thanksgiving and Hanukkah, as well as deep into the Christmas season. Such hours take their toll on family life, and I thank you for the sacrifices made by you and your loved ones throughout. For those who might be tuning into the ETC for the first time, please know that over 90% of our actions are not only bipartisan, but unanimous. I challenge anyone to find an policymaking body in Washington with a more consistent record of consensus. We agree today that the internet is and should remain open and freedom enhancing. It is and always has been so for existing law. Beyond that, we disagree. The contrast between our perspectives could not be sharper. My colleagues and I will deliver our statements and cast our votes. Then I am confident that we will move to other issues where we can find common ground once again. I look forward to working on public policy that is more positive and constructive for American uh, economic and consumer choice. William Shakespeare taught us in The Tempest what's past is prologue. That time-tested axiom applies to today's commission action. In 2008, the FCC tried to reach beyond its legal authority to regulate the and it was slapped back by an appellate court only eight short months ago. Today, the commission is choosing to ignore the recent past as it attempts the same act. In so doing, the FCC is not only defying a court, but it is circumventing the will of a large bipartisan majority of Congress as well. More than 300 members have warned the agency against exceeding its legal authority. The FCC is not Congress. We cannot make laws. Legislating is the sole domain of the directly elected representatives of the American people. If the majority is determined to ignore the growing chorus of voices emanating from Capitol Hill in what appears to some as an obsessive quest to regulate at all costs. Some are saying that instead of acting as a cop on the beat, the FCC looks more like a regulatory vigilante. Moreover, the agency is further angering Congress by ignoring increasing calls for a cessation of its actions and choosing instead to move ahead just as members leave town. As a result, the FCC has provocatively charted a collision course with the legislative branch. Furthermore, on the night of Friday, December 10th, just two business days before the, uh, before the public would be prohibited by law from communicating further with us about this proceeding, the Commission dumped nearly 2,000 pages of documents into the record. As if that weren't enough, the FCC unloaded an additional 1,000 pages into the record less than 24 hours before the end of the public comment period. All of these extreme measures defying the D.C. Circuit, Congress, undermining the public comment process have been de deployed to deliver on a misguided campaign promise. Not only is today the winter solstice, the darkest of the year, but it marks one of the darkest days in recent FCC history. I am disappointed in these ends justify the means tactics and the doubts they have created about this agency. The FCC is capable of better. Today is not its finest hour. Using these new, new rules as a weapon, politically favored companies will be able to pressure three political appointees to regulate their rivals to gain competitive advantages. Litigation will supplant innovation. Instead of investing in tomorrow's technologies, precious capital will be diverted to pay lawyers' fees. The era of internet regulatory arbitrage has dawned. And to say that today's rules don't regulate the internet is like saying that regulating highway on-ramps, off-ramps, and its pavement doesn't equate to regulating the highway themselves. 
what had been bottom-up, non-governmental and grassroots-based internet governance will become politicized. Today, the United States is abandoning the long-standing bipartisan and international consensus to insulate the internet from state meddling in favor of a preference for top-down control by unelected political appointees, three of whom will decide what constitutes reasonable behavior. Through its actions, the majority is inviting countries around the globe to do the same thing. Reasonable is a subjective term. Not only is it perhaps the most litigated word in American history, its definition varies radically from country to country. The precedent has now been set for the internet to be subjected to state interpretation reasonable by governments of all stripes. In fact, at the United Nations just last Wednesday, a renewed effort by representatives from countries such as China and Saudi Arabia is calling for what one press account says is, quote, an international body made up of government representatives that would attempt to create global standards for policing the internet, end quote. By not just sanctioning, but encouraging more state intrusion into the internet's affairs, the majority is fueling a global internet regulatory pandemic. Internet freedom will not be enhanced, it will suffer. My dissent this morning is based on four primary concerns. First, nothing is broken in the internet access market that needs fixing. Second, the FCC does not have the legal authority to issue these rules. Third, the proposed rules are likely to cause irreparable harm. And fourth, existing law and internet governance structures provide ample consumer protection in the event of a systemic market failure. Before I go further, however, I apologize if my statement does not address some important issues raised by the order. But we received the current draft at 11.42 p.m. last night, and my team is still combing through it. First, Nothing is broken in the internet access market that needs fixing. All levels of the internet supply chain are thriving due to robust competition and low market entry barriers. The internet has flourished because it was privatized in 1994. And at this point, I need to dispel a pervasive myth that broadband was once regulated like a phone company. Not only was the FCC's 2002 cable modem order unanimous, it did not move broadband from Title II. It formalized an effort started under Bill Kennard's FCC. But I will include a more thorough history as part of my statement. Since its privatization, the internet has migrated further away from government control until today. Its success was the result of bottom-up collaboration and not top-down regulation. No one needs permission to start a website or navigate the web freely. To suggest otherwise is nothing short of fear-mongering. Myriad suppliers of internet-related devices, applications, online services, and connectivity are driving productivity, productivity and job growth in our country. About 80% of Americans own a personal computer. Most are connected to the internet. In the meantime, the internet is going mobile. By this time next year, consumers will see more smartphones in the U.S. market than feature phones. In addition to countless applications used on PCs, growth in the number of mobile applications available to consumers has gone from nearly zero in 2007 to a half a million just three years later. Mobile app downloads are growing at an annual rate of 92 percent, with an estimated 50 billion applications expected to be downloaded in 2012 probably most of which will be downloaded by my children onto my iPhone. Fixed and mobile broadband internet access is the fastest penetrating disruptive technology in history. In 2003, only 15% of Americans had access to broadband. Just seven years later, 95% do. Eight announced national broadband, mobile, uh, national broadband providers are building out facilities in addition to the 
construction work of scores more local and regional providers. More competition is on the way as providers light up recently auctioned spectra. Furthermore, the Commission's work to make unlicensed use of the television or white spaces available to consumers will create even more competition and choice. In short, competition, investments, innovation, productivity, and job growth are healthy and dynamic in the Internet sector thanks to bipartisan deregulatory policies that have spanned four decades. The Internet has blossomed under current law. Policies that promote abundance and competition rather than the rationing and unintended consequences that come with regulation are the best antidotes to the potential anti-competitive behavior feared by the rules proponents. But don't take my word for it. Every time the government has examined the broadband market, its experts have concluded that no evidence of concentrations or abuses of market power exists. The Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, one of the premier antitrust authorities in government, not only concluded that the broadband market was competitive, but it also warned that regulators should be wary of network management rules because of the unknown, quote, net effects on consumers, end quote. The FTC rendered that unanimous and bipartisan conclusion in 2007. As I discussed earlier, the broadband market has become only more competitive since then. More recently, the Department of Justice's Antitrust Division reached a similar conclusion when it filed comments with us earlier this year. While it sounded optimistic regarding the prospects for broadband competition, it also warned against the temptation to regulate, quote, to avoid stifling the infrastructure investments needed to expand broadband access, end quote. Disturbingly, the Commission is taking its radical step today without conducting even a rudimentary market analysis. Perhaps that is because a market study would not support the order's predetermined conclusion. My second point is the FCC does not have the legal authority to issue these rules. Time does not allow for me to refute all of the legal arguments raised in the order the newest version of which we are still reviewing, uh, but I will uh, do my best. I have included a more thorough analysis in the supplemental section of this statement. Nonetheless, I'll touch on a few of the legal arguments endorsed by the majority. Overall, the order is designed to circumvent the D.C. Circuit's Comcast decision, but this new effort will fail in court as well. The order makes a first-time claim that somehow, through the deregulatory bent of Section 706, Way back in 1996, Congress gave the Commission direct authority to regulate the Internet. The order admits that its rationale requires the Commission to reverse its long-standing interpretation that this section conveys no additional authority beyond which what is already provided elsewhere in the Act. This new conclusion, however, is suddenly convenient for the majority while it grasps for a foundation for its predetermined outcome. Instead of quote, removing barriers to infrastructure investment, end quote, as Section 706 encourages, the order fashions a legal, legal fiction to construct additional barriers. This move is arbitrary and capricious and is not supported by the evidence in the record or a change of law. The Commission's gamesmanship with Section 706 throughout this year is reminiscent of what was attempted with the contortions of the so-called 7070 rule three years ago. I objected to, to such factual legal manipulations then, and I object to them now. Furthermore, the order desperately scours the act to find a tether to moor its alleged Title I ancillary authority. As expected, the order's legal analysis ignores the fundamental teachings of the Comcast case. The Titles II, III, and VI of the Communications Act give the FCC the power to regulate specific recognized classes of electronic communication services, which consist of common carriage telephony, broadcasting, and other licensed wireless services and multi-channel video programming services. Despite the desires of some, Congress has not established a new title of the Act to police Internet network management, not even implicitly. 
The absence of statutory authority is perhaps why members of Congress introduced legislation to give the FCC such powers. In other words, if the Act already gave the Commission the legal tether it seeks, why was legislation needed in the first place? I'm afraid that this leaky ship of an order is attempting to sail through a regulatory fog without the necessary ballast of factual or legal substance. The courts will easily sink it. In another act of legal sleight of hand, the order claims that it does not attempt to classify broadband services as Title II common carrier services. Yet functionally, that is precisely what the majority is attempting to do to Title I information services, Title III licensed wireless services, and Title VI video services by subjecting them to non-discrimination obligations in the absence of a congressional mandate. What we have before us today is a Title II order dressed in a threadbare Title I disguise. Thankfully, the courts have seen this bait and switch maneuver by the FCC before, and they have struck it down each time. The order's expansive grasp for jurisdictional power here is likely to alarm any review in court because the effort appears to have no limiting principle. If we were to accept the order's argument, it would virtually free the commission from its congressional tether, to quote many past courts. As the Supreme Court explained in Mid Midwest Video 2, quote, without reference to the provisions of the act expressly granting regulatory authority, the commission's ancillary jurisdiction would be unbounded, end quote. I am relieved, however, that in the order, the commission is explicitly refraining from regulating coffee shops. In short, if this order stands, there is no end in sight to the Commission's powers. I also have concerns regarding the constitutional implications of the order, especially its trampling on the First and Fifth Amendments. But again, in the observance of time, those thoughts are contained in my extended written remarks. My third concern is that the Commission's rules will cause irreparable harm to broadband investment and consumers. DOJ's cogent observation from last January regarding the competitive nature of the broadband market raises the important issue of the likely irreparable harm to be brought about by these new rules. In addition to government agencies, investors, investment analysts, and broadband companies themselves have told us that network management rules would create uncertainty to the point where crucial investment capital will become harder to find. This point was made over and over again at the FCC's Capital Formation Workshop on October 1, 2009. A diverse gathering of investors and analysts told us that even rules emanating from Title I would create uncertainty. Other evidence suggests that Internet management rules could not only make it difficult for companies to, quote, predict their revenues and cash flow, end quote, but a new regime could, quote, have the perverse effect of raising prices to all users, end quote. Additionally, today's order implies that the FCC has price regulation authority over broadband. In fact, the D.C. Circuit noted in its Comcast decision last spring that the Commission's attorneys openly asserted at January's oral argument that, quote, the Commission could someday subject broadband service to pervasive rate regulation to ensure that a broadband company provides the service at reasonable charges." End quote. Nothing indicates that the Commission has changed its mind since, in fact, the order appears to support both direct and indirect price regulation of broadband services. Moreover, as lobbying groups accept this order's invitation to file complaints asking the government to distort the market further, the Commission will be under increasing pressure from political interest groups to expand its power and influence over the broadband market. In fact, some of my colleagues today are complaining that the order doesn't go far enough. Each complaint filed will create more uncertainty as the enforcement process becomes a de facto rulemaking circus, just as the Commission attempted in the ill-fated Comcast BitTorrent case. How does this framework create 
regulatory certainty. Even the European Commission recognized the harm rules would cause to the capital markets when it decided last month not to impose measures similar to these. Part of the argument in favor of new rules alleges that giant corporations will serve as hostile gatekeepers to the Internet. First, in the almost nine years since those fears were first sown, net regulation lobbyists can point to fewer than in a handful of cases of alleged misconduct out of an infinite number of Internet communications. All, all of those cases were resolved in favor of consumers under current law. More importantly, however, many broadband providers are not large companies. Many are small businesses. Take, for example, the Lariat, a fixed wireless internet service provider serving rural communities in Wyoming. Lariat has told the Commission that the imposition of network management rules will impede its ability to obtain investment capital and will limit the company's, quote, ability to deploy new service to currently unserved and underserved areas, end quote. Furthermore, Lariat echoes the views of many others by asserting that, quote, the imposition of regulations that would drive up costs or hamper innovation would further deter future outside investment in our company and others like it, end quote. Additionally, quote, to mandate overly burdensome network management policies would foster lower quality of service, raise operating costs, which in turn would raise prices for all subscribers, and or create a large backlog of adjudicative proceedings at the FCC in which it would be prohibitively expensive for small and competitive ISPs to participate, end quote. Lariat also notes that the imposition of neutrality rules would cause immediate harm such that, quote, due to the immediate deleterious impacts upon investment, these damaging effects would be likely to occur even if the Commission's order was later invalidated, nullified, or effectively modified by a court challenge or congressional action." End quote. And many other small businesses have echoed these concerns, and all of this is in the record. Less investment, less innovation, increased business costs, increased prices for consumers, disadvantages to smaller ISPs, jobs lost, and all of this in the name of promoting the exact opposite. The evidence in the record simply does not support the majority's outcome-driven conclusions. In short, the Commission's action today runs directly counter to the laudable broadband deployment and adoption goals of the National Broadband Plan. No government has ever succeeded in mandating investment and innovation, and nothing has been holding back, nothing has been holding back Internet investment and innovation until now. The fourth point of my dissent is existing law provides ample consumer protection. To reiterate, the order fails to put forth a factual or legal basis for regulatory intervention. Repeated government economic analyses have reached the same conclusion. No concentrations or abuses of market power exist in the broadband space. If market failure were to occur, however, America's antitrust and consumer protection laws stand at the ready. Both the Department of Justice and the Federal Trade Commission are well equipped to cure any market ills. In fact, the antitrust law section of the American Bar Association agrees. Nowhere does the order attempt to explain why these laws are insufficient in its quest for more regulation. Moreover, for several years I've been advocating a potentially effective approach that won't get overturned on appeal. In lieu of new rules, which will be tied up in court for years now, the FCC could create a new role for itself by partnering, partnering with already established non-governmental internet governance groups, engineers, consumer groups, academics, economists, antitrust experts, consumer protection agencies, industry associations, and many others to spotlight allegations of anti-competitive conduct in the broadband market and work together to resolve them. Since it was privatized, Internet governance has always been based on a foundation of bottom-up collaboration and cooperation rather than top-down regulation. This truly light approach has created a near-perfect track record 
solving internet management conflicts without intervention. Unfortunately, the majority has not even considered this idea at the moment. But once today's order is overturned on appeal, it is still my hope that the FCC will consider and adopt this constructive proposal. In sum, what's passed is indeed prologue. We left the saga of the FCC's last net neutrality order before was with a spectacular failure in the appellate courts. Today, the FCC seems determined to make the same mistake instead of learning from it. The only illness apparent from this order is regulatory hubris. Fortunately, cures for this malady are obtainable in court. For all the foregoing reasons, I respectfully, just in case you're guessing, <laughs> dissent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. A few weeks ago, I discussed the importance of collaboration and the important yet difficult policy issues before us today. I want to pause for a moment and thank my very overworked but dedicated staff, Angela Cronenberg, Louis Perez, and Dave Grimaldi, and their families, uh, Commissioner Copps and his staff, thank you so very much, the Office of the Chairman, uh, the Commission staff, and the thousands of stakeholders who engaged with us over the past 16 months in crafting a framework that gives both broadband providers and consumers clear guidance about provider behavior is acceptable and what is not. It was a result of all of your engagement, from the filings you made to the many meetings we had, that we have been able to get to this point today. Your dedication to the process and of those whom you represent should be commended. Of course, as we all know, compromises typically must be made as many different interests collaborate on critical and significant issues. As a result, it is often the case that one cannot be completely satisfied with the outcome. Nonetheless, it is my belief that he, we have made great progress in this proceeding, and through this order, we are ensuring that the Internet will remain open for the benefit of many consumers. After all, they are the ultimate beneficiaries of an open Internet. Left to my own devices, there are several issues I would have tackled differently. As such, I am approving in part and concurring in part to today's order. Well, I appreciate the Chairman's recognition of some of my concerns and the adjustments made in the order to allay those concerns. There are several areas I would have strengthened so that more consumers would benefit from the protections we are adopting. First, I would have extended all of the fixed rules to mobile so that those consumers who heavily or exclusively rely on mobile broadband would be fully protected. There is evidence in our record that some communities, namely African American and Hispanic, use and rely upon mobile internet access much more than other socioeconomic groups. So while this order does not go as far as I would like in protecting mobile consumers, I am pleased that it is quite clear that we are not pre-approving any action by mobile providers that would violate the fixed rules and the general principles of Internet openness. Moreover, the order provides for the ongoing monitoring of the mobile broadband marketplace, including the Commission's intention to create an open Internet Advisory Committee. That specific mission will be to assess and report to the Commission new developments and concern in the mobile broadband industry. I expect that the committee will closely observe the effects of that disparate rules for fixed and mobile providers will have on consumers who have chosen to cut the broadband cord as well as the effects on intermodal competition. To that end, the commission will stand ready to protect mobile consumers from any actions by providers that are inconsistent with an open internet. Second, I would have prohibited pay for priority arrangements altogether. The order stresses the various harmful effects of these arrangements 
including the serious threat to innovation on the Internet. I believe that prohibiting such arrangements would be more appropriate based on the evidence before us. Nonetheless, should providers enter into such arrangements and they are subsequently challenged at the Commission, providers will have to demonstrate that the arrangement is not harmful and is consistent with the public interest. Third, an open Internet should be available to all end users, potential enterprise for profit or not. This order goes a long way toward protecting an open Internet for residents, small businesses, schools, libraries, patrons of coffee shops, bookstores, and the like. But I worry that those who may not fit into these categories will have to negotiate for access to the open Internet and that they may be denied such access. We should carefully monitor whether an open Internet is truly available to all end users and correct course if needed. I hope that the aforementioned Open Internet Advisory Committee can track any harmful effects on those end users who do not currently qualify for protections adopted today and the committee recommend commission action as necessary. Finally, earlier this year, I stated my preference for the commission's legal authority over broadband internet access service. While the route taken here is not the one I originally preferred, I believe that it is a for the Commission to act to protect an open Internet. I know there will be many lawyers studying the legal authority cited in this order in the weeks, months, and perhaps years ahead, and judicial review ultimately will determine the fate of this order. I sincerely hope that the Commission's authority to, to protect consumers' access to an open Internet is upheld. Today, the Internet is as critical to the nation for communicating as our legacy telephone, broadcast, and mobile phone networks. As described more fully in the order, without an open internet, consumers will have fewer choices and opportunities, which has the potential to impact many aspects of their lives. Their ability to obtain an education, telecommute, look for a job, search for information online, shop, make investment decisions, communicate with friends, family, and colleagues, obtain news, and I can go on and on, but I won't, given the length of the meeting today. Accordingly, I believe that it is necessary and appropriate that broadband providers operate pursuant to a legal policy and framework that ensures that the Internet remains open under the Commission's watchful eye. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Commissioner Clyburn. <laughs> Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, respectfully, I really, really, really dissent. Um, I disagree with the policy, the policy, I disagree with the politics, and I disagree with the procedure of this item. Uh, like my colleague, Commissioner McDowell, I also have a longer um, written statement that I'll ask to be put into the record and try and share remarks here. Preserving the open Internet is non-negotiable. It is a bedrock principle shared by all in the Internet economy, a building block on which we can all agree. And the Internet is open today. The evidentiary record in our proceeding has reaffirmed that government action is not necessary to preserve it. Yet the majority acts and acts decisively to adopt net neutrality rules, imposing the heavy hand of government into how broadband networks will be managed and operated. The data most certainly does not drive us to this result. In the final analysis, the Commission intervenes to regulate the Internet because it wants to, not because it needs to. I cannot support this decision. It is not a consumer-driven or engineering-focused decision. It is not motivated by a tangible competitive harm or market failure. The majority bypasses the market power analysis altogether and acts on speculative harms alone. They are unable to identify a single ongoing practice if they find problematic. In the end, the Internet will be no more open tomorrow than it is today. The majority does all of this without any apparent appreciation of the regulatory costs and distortive effect of government micromanagement of broadband networks. Did the Commission kill the future of the Internet today? Of course not. But in a dynamic industry, they have no rational means to estimate the real damage they did to the future development of business models 
network management techniques, and core networks. The Commission put its thumb on the scale as to where innovation in the Internet economy will be focused and how future networks will be financed. The order repeatedly expresses concerns about the significant consequences to Internet edge companies if their incentive to innovate and investment is chilled. The majority ignores the same grave consequences of government action chilling networks analogous incentives to innovate and invest. It is regrettable that the majority did not take a more holistic view of the Internet economy. I keep returning to what should be a threshold question. Why do we intervene in the one sector of the economy that is working so well to create high-paying jobs, untold com consumer choice, and entrepreneurial opportunity? The only reason left is to deliver on one of the President's campaign promises. I must respectfully dissent. I have seven principal objections to this order. I actually have way more than that, but I have a plane to catch, so you're lucky. <laughs> Before I start, I want to touch on the question of regulatory certainty. The net neutrality in Title II proceedings have been an economic drag on operators for over a year. I empathize with businesses that desperately need certainty to help jumpstart efforts to invest and recover economically. It was our stable regulatory foundation that gave investors the confidence to pump billions into the Internet economy, and I share the desire to find a new stable footing. I object, however, to the majority suggesting that its action is premised on providing regulatory certainty. At best, the majority solves a problem of its own making. I also have some apprehension whether our legally precarious action today can provide the certainty promised and whether our decision will, unfortunately, add to that uncertainty. Concern number one, the majority's decision lacks an analytical framework to justify government intervention. Competition and consumer demand have ensured that the Internet remains open, and the majority offers record evidence to suggest otherwise. The majority resorts to metaphor. There are cracks in the infrastructure. But our record does not support a conclusion of any real structural failing. At best, there's a burned-out bulb in the Christmas lights, and we endeavor to replace the entire electrical system to fix it. There is no global problem, no crisis of magnitude, to justify the majority's overreach. The majority's repeated fallback is that network operators have incentives to act badly. The language is consistently conditional. The word could alone appears 61 times. Throughout the decision, the majority presumes a malign intent on the part of broadband providers for which there's no factual foundation. This line of reasoning is flatly inconsistent with a decade of actual industry practice. If the incentives for misconduct are so strong, one would assume the evidentiary record would include widespread examples of anti-competitive conduct. There is no such evidence. Given the non-existent factual record to support its action, the majority is left to grand declarations about the Internet as an indispensable platform supporting our nation's economic and civic life to mask the clear deficiencies of its analysis. In doing so, they ignore the FTC's warning that regulators should be wary of enacting net neutrality regulation solely to prevent prospective harm. I share the FTC's concerns. Concern number two. The majority's claim that consumers will benefit from this government overreach is unsupported and deeply flawed. The majority repeatedly couches this as a pro-consumer or a consumer-driven approach. They try to frame this as big business gatekeeper versus the consumer. But upon closer inspection, the order is focused on promoting the edge, internet applications and services over networks and consumers. I strongly disagree that promoting the edge over the networks because there was no choice necessary. In this instance, having your cupcake and eating it too is an actual option. And the majority's quest to address allegations that broadband providers may try to pick winners and losers, the government has picked its own winners. In the long term, I'm worried that the government's poor management of tomorrow's Internet will leave consumers worse off. Efforts to ensure that all Americans have access to broadband will be put at risk. Efforts to get the third of American households that are not broadband subscribers online will be challenged. And if network upgrades and improvements are delayed, 
before gone, entrepreneurs won't be able to create and consumers won't be able to use the next great application. Forgive me if I do not view these potential developments as pro-consumer. The order's analysis of the new rules also contradicts any claimed consumer focus. With respect to paid prioritization, the majority concludes that prioritization arrangements with consumers would be unlikely to violate our rules. In contrast, deals with third-party internet companies would raise significant cause for concern. In other words, charging end users end user consumers is fine, but charging internet companies is not. By seeking to carve out application providers from any future compensation models, the practical effect of this decision may be that the cost of building out tomorrow's networks will be borne by the consumers. The price tag is estimated to be $180 billion in the next five years alone. A similar preference for edge companies over consumers is reflected by the majority's approach to transparency. Transparency should be about giving consumers the basic tools to make an informed decision. We should be working across the internet economy towards standardized disclosures to inform consumer choice to set, shed sunlight, good and bad, on practices of networks, applications, and devices. That is not the approach the majority takes. The language of the order is exceedingly prescriptive. The majority can, seeks to micromanage how information is conveyed to broadband consumers and edge companies. By doing so, the order sets up a transparent regime that may be so detailed and engineering focused that the average consumer will be no better off. Concern number three, majority's focus on preserving network operators' current conditions will distort tomorrow's internet. Given the dynamic nature of the internet, focusing on preserving today's networks and practices is the wrong objective. The internet is not a mature market, and networks cannot stand still. The capacity to meet the escalating demands of existing users, let alone new users, will strain the resources of all operators and test network management practices. There also continues to be a amount of experimentation in business models and consumer expectations. The threat of government censure will unmistakably chill new developments and ability of networks to evolve. Innovation at your own risk is the wrong message to send, but I'm it's the message that will be received. Troubled by the negative treatment of so many vital components of our broadband networks, our modern broadband networks receive in this order. We have turned prioritization into a dirty word. To me, it is quality of service and optimizing services for real time applications. 4G won't even work properly without prioritization. Special services should be embraced. They have been primary drivers of voice and video competition and have been critical to justify the cost of today's and tomorrow's networks. Network management is similarly viewed as a potential loophole for misconduct, not an engineering marvel. I do not think the majority believes any of these functionalities are inherently problematic, but the overwhelming focus on the potential for wrongdoing is misplaced. It is fair to highlight potential areas of concern, but only in the context of a much more balanced and objective presentation. Concern number four. The majority puts the commission in the unworkable role of net referee. The genius of the internet to date is that there is no central command, unitary authority to dictate how innovation is to occur. No one must ask for permission. The majority has altered fundamentally that winning formula, forcing the commission into the role of judging how broadband networks will evolve. Adopting rules that will require significant interpretation by creating new undefined terms and by muddling its analysis with cautionary notes, the majority has ensured that the new innovation and new practices will be subject to its approval. This adds delay and uncertainty, and I fear the government will take too prominent a role in shaping tomorrow's internet. Concern number five in this the majority regulates an entire sector of the internet without any legitimate legal authority to do so. The DC Circuit only months ago rejected our attempt to enforce net neutrality principles. 
the Commission will return to court with the same basic infirmities. First, we have no explicit statutory authority to support this decision. And second, the majority's legal theory would give the Commission an unbounded to adopt any policies it wants to promote a particular vision of the Internet. The FCC literally has no power to act until unless Congress gives it power. Congress has never given the Commission authority to regulate Internet network management, a fact validated by the court in Comcast. The majority, however, tries the everything but the kitchen sink defense, 24 claim statutory bases. The majority elects sheer quantity to make up for quality, and in doing so, contorts the letter and the spirit of the act to try to justify rules adopted in a results-oriented process. The bulk of the legal support is based on ancillary authority grounds that are indistinguishable from the ones rejected by Comcast, the court in Comcast. So I will therefore just focus on section 706A. I am not persuaded by the majority's attempt to twist a 14-year-old deregulatory policy statement into an affirmative grant of authority. Section 706 directs the Commission to encourage broadband relying on authority elsewhere in the Act. Our decisions are informed by Section 706. It is a guidepost as to how to use our statutory mandated respons responsibilities. The Commission held long ago that the most logical statutory interpretation is that Section 706 does not constitute an independent grant of authority. The majority attempts unsuccessfully to rewrite this straightforward provision and its clear-cut history. The core of the majority's analysis is its mischaracterization of the 1998 Advanced Services Order. Under the majority's view, the Commission has never interpreted Section 706 in its totality. The Commission raises this identical argument in to the Comcast Court and it was appropriately rejected. Even if Section 706 were a grant of authority, that provision could not support today's prospective and investment chilling action that raises barriers to, to broadband network investment. The text of Section 706A is clear. It is about encouraging broadband deployment with a clear deregulatory focus on removing barriers to infrastructure investment. The Commission has no authority to erect obstacles in the name of removing them. It strains all credibility to contend that imposing net neutrality obligations could promote broadband deployment. By reading out of the provision any deregulatory focus, the deployment purpose, and the removal of barrier limitation, the Commission has given itself plenary authority to regulate the Internet. Anything that promotes the virtuous cycle in the Internet ecosystem could be regulated. This is my biggest concern with the majority Section 706A analysis. In essence, the majority has replaced an unbounded ancillary authority rejected by the Comcast Court with an equally unbounded direct authority. Trading one unlimited power for another is far from comforting to me. When the Commission feels compelled to explicitly decline to apply our rules directly to coffee shops, bookstores, airlines, it illustrates the lack of any ascertainable outer limits to our authority. I also have to believe a court will be skeptical of the timing and the manner in which the majority has discovered Section 706A to be a superpower, unlocked only after an adverse court opinion and political press finds some legal foundation to justify sweeping net neutrality rules. Concern number six, the majority's decision to act as a legislator not regulator, is a mistake that may undermine our agency's mission. The Commission adopts rules that are almost word for word a draft bill under consideration in Congress. We are a creature of Congress, not Congress itself. Using a legislative proposal to base our actions underscores that the majority acts beyond the appropriate role of an independent agency. When the Commission makes political decisions and takes actions best left to officials, our proceedings inevitably turn more partisan and more controversial. If this magnitude, with such significant long-term consequences, are our decisions best left to Congress? 
And concern number seven, opportunity cost. By that, I mean that we have squandered months on this effort, diverting resources and political capital away from real problems that lie within our core competencies. This spring, a unanimous commission called for action on broadband deployment and adoption, spectrum reform, universal service and intercarrier compensation reform, and a public safety network. Our focus belongs on that agenda, an actual pro-growth, pro-job game plan. Starting today, we should redouble our efforts to craft policies to create regula the regulatory environment necessary to attract the billions more in risk capital necessary to expand and improve our broadband infrastructure. I fear that today's action is not the end of this debate because of its significant consequences for the Internet, for the jurisdictional authority of this agency, and for the proper role of the FCC. This debate, this debate may well move to different fora, but I fear it will continue to take up too much oxygen in our community. That said, I remain always the optimist. Okay, I have to admit that this was actually a really good test of it, but still, I believe that when we work together, there's really much good that we can do. I hope that the new year brings a fresh perspective on our nation's communications challenges and a renewed focus on working collaboratively together. While I may disagree with our decision, I do want to thank all of you at the table and those that have worked through on this issue through Thanksgiving, much of the holiday season, and a power outage. You guys sure earned a Christmas break this year. Um, importantly, I also want to thank my staff and their for their unbelievably hard work these past few weeks. Um, in particular, I want to express my gratitude to Brad Gilland, who I just couldn't have done without your tireless, okay now kind of tired, um, ability to get everything on the checklist done, your unstoppable good nature, and your awesome, as in truly inspiring, awe work product. Um, thank you to all of you, and thank you also to your families. I'm particularly grateful to Hillary. I'm certain that she would have had you spend your holiday season a little bit differently. Um, I feel compelled to make one last statement. Um, we can disagree about policy decisions as we do here, but we should all agree that an open and sound process is critical to our decision making, particularly when the stakes are this, the future shape of the internet policy and the millions of jobs that depend upon it. And regrettably, I think this process failed at every step of this way. The most significant failure actually happened to be the last one. My office, as mentioned, did not receive a copy of today's order until 11.30 last night, and it had significant changes from the previous draft. So um, 12 hours before the meeting is, is not sufficient, um, given the magnitude of the issues that are at stake and the sheer number of changes, again, that had been made. Uh, it's, it's kind of, it's inexcusable. And Mr. Chairman, you've set a higher bar for this agency to be data-driven and transparent, and you have lived up to that, um, but not here. So um, this is an, an inopportune time to do that. Um, this proceeding did not need to be done in such a rushed and ill-considered manner this month. Um, I think we can all do better, and let's do so in the new year. Well, let me start with a quote. Uh, the web as we know it is being threatened. That's Tim Berners, the inventor of the World Wide Web, in a recent article. He continued, and I quote, a neutral communications medium is the basis of a fair, competitive market economy, of democracy, and of science. Although the internet and web generally thrive on lack of regulation, some basic values have to be legally preserved. Today, for the first time, the FCC is adopting rules to preserve basic internet values. While the Commission had in the past pursued bipartisan enforcement of open internet principles, we have not had properly adopted rules. Now, for the first time, we'll have enforceable rules of the road to preserve internet freedom and openness. Now, to be clear, as we stand here now, the freedom and openness of the internet are unprotected. No rules on the books to protect basic internet values. No process for monitoring internet openness as technology and business models evolve. No recourse for innovators, consumers, 
teachers or, or speakers harmed by improper practices, and no predictability for internet service providers so that they can effectively manage and invest in broadband networks. That will change once we vote to approve this strong and balanced order. The vote on the order comes after many months of debate, which has often produced more heat than light. Almost everyone says they agree that the openness of the internet is essential. That openness has unleashed an first wave of innovation, economic growth, job creation, small business generation, and vibrant free expression. And of course, that's right. Despite a shared allegiance to the internet as an open platform, there's been intense disagreement about the role of government in preserving internet freedom and openness. On one end of the spectrum, there are those who say government should do nothing at all on open internet. On the other end are those who would adopt uh, extensive, overly detailed and rigid regulations. A few on each side impose litmus tests. To some, unless their test is met, open internet rules are fake net neutrality. To others, unless their test is met, open internet rules are, quote, a government takeover of the internet. Now that's chutzpah, if I can borrow one of your phrases, <laughs> Commissioner McDowell. For myself, I reject both extremes in favor of a strong and sensible non-ideological framework, one that protects internet freedom and openness and promotes robust innovation and investment throughout the broadband ecosystem. Because none of these goals are abstraction. They live or die not in theory, but in practice. That's the work of grappling with technology, business, and real world consumer experiences. Now, in this issue, we do encounter familiar arguments. We heard some today, the kind trot to oppose almost any government action, dealing with nonfiction rather than fiction. Uh, there are uh, many points that don't need response, but let me touch on a couple. We're told by some, for example, not to try to fix what isn't broken, and that rules of the road for internet freedom would discourage innovation and, and investment. But countless innovators, investors, and business executives say just the opposite, including many, including many who generally oppose government regulation. Over the course of this proceeding, we've heard from so many entrepreneurs, engineers, venture capitalists, CEOs, and others working daily to invent and distribute new internet products and thereby maintain U.S. leadership in innovation. Their message has been clear. The next decade of innovation in this sector is at risk without sensible FCC rules of the road. As one leading early stage investor put it in thoughts echoed in a letter we received from 30 prominent capitalists, quote, the lack of basic rules of the road for what network providers and others can and can't do is starting to hamper innovation and growth. And as we heard in the letter, more than two dozen leading technology CEOs, quote, common sense baseline rules are to ensuring that the internet remains a key engine of economic growth, innovation, and global competitiveness. The innovators, entrepreneurs, and tech leaders recognize, as I do, vital need for massive investment in broadband infrastructure. Based on their in-market experience, they also tell us that broadband providers have natural business incentives to leverage their positions as gatekeepers in ways that would stifle innovation the benefits of the internet. They point out that even after the partisan basis announced open internet principles in 2005, we've seen clear and troubling deviations from open practices. Given the importance of an open internet to our economic future, given the potentially irreversible nature of some harmful practices, and given the competition issues among band providers, our record is filled with filings from businesses and consumer groups alike that it is essential that the FCC fulfill its historic role, cop on the beat, to ensure the vitality of our communications networks and to empower and protect entrepreneurs and consumers of those networks. Now, at the same time, government must not overreach 
by imposing rules that are overly restrictive or that assume perfect knowledge about the dynamic and rapidly changing marketplace. We know that to meet our broadband speed and deployment goals for the country, broadband providers must have the business incentives to invest many billions of dollars to build out their networks. They must have the ability to run their networks effectively and the flexibility to experiment with new business models to further drive private investment. Today, we're adopting a set of high-level rules of the road that strikes the right balance between these imperatives. We're adopting a framework that will increase certainty for businesses, investors, and entrepreneurs. In key respects, the interests of edge innovators, the entrepreneurs creating internet content services and applications, their interests, the interests of broadband providers, American consumers are aligned. Innovation at the edge catalyzes consumer demand for broadband. Consumer demand spurs private investment and innovation in faster broadband networks, and faster networks sparks ever cooler innovation at the edge. I believe our action today will foster an ongoing cycle of massive investment, innovation, and consumer demand, both at the edge and in the core of broadband networks. Our action will strengthen the internet job creation engine. Our action will advance our goal of having America's broadband networks be the freest and the fastest in the world. Our action will ensure internet freedom at home, a foundation for fighting for internet freedom around the world. The crux of the order we're adopting, which is based on a strong and sound legal framework rooted in the Communications Act is straightforward. Here are the key principles it enshrines and the key rules designed to preserve internet freedom and openness. First, consumers and innovators have a right to know the basic performance characteristics of their internet access and how their network is being managed. The transparency rule we adopt today will give consumers and innovators the clear and simple information they need to make informed choices in choosing networks or designing the next killer app. Shining a light on network management practices in a non-prescriptive -pres -pres way will also have an important deterrent effect on bad. Second, consumers and innovators have a right to send and receive lawful traffic, to go where they want, say what they want, experiment with ideas on the internet, commercial and social, and use the devices of their choice. The rules thus prohibit the blocking of lawful content, apps, services, and the connection of devices to the network. Third, consumers and innovators have a right to a level playing field. No central authority, public or private, should have the power to pick winners or losers on the internet. That's the role of the commercial market and then the marketplace of ideas. So, so we're adopting a ban on unreasonable discrimination, and we're making clear that we're not approving so-called pay-for-priority arrangements involving fast lanes for some companies, but not others. The order states that, that as a general rule, such arrangements won't satisfy the no unreasonable discrimination standard because it simply isn't consistent with an open for broadband providers to skew the marketplace by favoring one idea or application or service over another by selectively prioritizing internet traffic. Fourth, the rules recognize that broadband providers need meaningful flexibility to manage their networks to deal with congestion, security, and other issues. And we also recognize the importance and value of business model experimentation, such as tiered pricing. These are practical necessities to promote investment in and expansion of high-speed broadband networks. So for, the example, so for example, the order makes clear that broadband providers can engage in reasonable network management, providing certainty. Fifth, the principle of internet openness applies to mobile broadband. In confusion on this, so let me be clear. There's one internet, and it must remain an open platform, however consumers and innovators access it. And so today, we're opting for the first time broadly applicable rules requiring transparency 
for mobile broadband providers and consumers, and prohibiting mobile broadband providers from blocking websites or blocking certain competitive applications. As I have said for many months, as many innovators and entrepreneurs have told us in the record, and as the facts and record bear out, there are differences between mobile and fixed broadband and that are relevant in determining what action government should take for mobile at this time. Among the differences, unique technical issues, spectrum and mobile networks, the stage and rate of innovation in mobile broadband, and market structure. Also, one of the largest mobile broadband providers has just begun providing 4G service using wireless spectrum subject to openness conditions adopted in connection with the auction of that spectrum. Importantly, our order makes clear that we are not endorsing or approving practices that the order doesn't prohibit, particularly conduct that is barred for fixed broadband. And we affirm our commitment to an ongoing process to ensure the continued evolution of mobile broadband in a way that's consistent with internet freedom and openness. Any reduction in mobile internet openness would be a cause for concern, as would any reduction in innovation and investment in mobile broadband applications, devices, or networks that depend on internet openness. Sixth, and finally, today's order recognizes the importance of vigilance in promptly enforcing the rules we're adopting, and vigilance in monitoring developments in areas such as mobile and the market services, which may affect internet openness. That's why I'm pleased that we've committed to create an open internet advisory committee that will assist the commission in monitoring the state of openness and the effects of our rules. We're also launching an open internet apps challenge on challenge.gov that will foster private sector development of applications to empower consumers with information about their own broadband connections, which will also help protect internet openness. The rules of the road we adopt today are rooted in ideas first articulated by Republican Chairman Michael Powell and Kevin Martin and endorsed in the unanimous FCC policy statement in 2005. And they are grounded in the record we have developed over the past 14 months, including more than 100,000 public comments, numerous public workshops, and hundreds of meetings with stakeholders ranging across the spectrum. The list of participants uh, also includes supportive input from the FTC and DOJ to the uh, opposite effect of what we heard earlier. Uh, the chairman of the FTC participated in person in our proceeding. I am proud of the process that we and the staff have run at the commission. It's been one of the most transparent in FCC. And I'm proud of the result, which has already garnered broad support from the technology industry, including TechNet, the Information Technology the Industry Council, the Internet Innovation Alliance, and the hundreds of technology companies those groups represent, as well as many other technology and internet companies. Support from investors of all sizes, including some of the nation's preeminent venture capitalists and angel investors. Our framework has also drawn support from key consumer, labor, and civil rights groups, a list that includes the Consumer Federation of America, Consumers Union, the Center for Democracy and Technology and the Communication Workers of America. I thank, thank them and the other groups that have worked so hard for many months on this issue. And our framework has been supported by a number of broadband providers as well who recognize The sensible and idea came out of uh, discussions that we had, and I think it'll be an important part of our ongoing processes. Uh, Commissioners McDowell and Baker, as you pointed out, this commission does tend to agree uh, uh, overwhelmingly 
uh, on the issues before us, uh, and I look forward to working together on a series of items to serve the public and grow our economy. I can't express enough appreciation to the remarkable staff of the FCC who have worked so hard and so well to wrestle with difficult issues and turn complex ideas into simple rules. Even as at this commission, we have done more than one thing at once. It's been uh, an extraordinary challenge for so many of the staff at the commission, uh, and we can't honor your service enough. That includes many offices and bureaus at the FCC, uh, some represented uh, by the leader here on the panel today, uh, many others uh, 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 working hard behind them, uh, including our Office of General Counsel, our Office of Strategic Planning, our Office of Engineering and Technology, and the Wireline, Wireless, Media, Consumer, International Bureaus. Uh, broadband is horizontal. It stretches across the Commission. We find increasingly that almost everything that we work on requires coordination and collaboration among our staff. Uh, and we see that in a healthy, productive, interactive way, which is easy to hard, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Let me join my colleagues in uh, thanking all the staff on the eighth floor, and in particularly, and in particular, the extraordinary team I'm lucky to have in the chairman's office: Eddie Lazarus, Zach Katz, Josh Gottheimer, Jen Howard, Maria Gaglio, Daniel Ornstein, Sean well above and beyond the call of duty, uh, keeping a wonderful sense of humor uh, every day, uh, a terrific spirit. Uh, you make each other smarter. You make me a lot smarter. Uh, I thank you for that. I apologize to your family, but I know they join me in honoring your service. Thanks to the work of these publicans. Uh, thanks uh, to our media office, which has uh, worked uh, around the clock since the beginning of this proceeding to make sure that uh, everything that we do is available online. Uh, we've set a new precedent, not just at the FCC, but around government uh, in the ways that we've opened up uh, this proceeding, permitting people to file comments online, uh, to participate interactively online. Uh, uh, the new media team makes it look uh, easy uh, to the people who participate. Uh, but it's very, very hard to do, especially given uh, the infrastructure challenges we have at the FCC. So I thank each of you uh, for your work under the leadership of Steve Van Roepel. Thanks to the work of all of the incredible public servants uh, uh, I mentioned, today a strengthened FCC is adopting rules to ensure that the Internet remains a powerful platform for innovation and job creation, to empower consumers and entrepreneurs, and protect free expression. These rules will increase certainty in the marketplace, spur investment both at the edge and in the core of our broadband networks, and contribute to a 21st century job creation engine in the United States. Finally, these rules fulfill many promises, including a promise to the future, a promise to the companies that don't yet exist, and the entrepreneurs who have yet started work in their dorm rooms or garage. For all that, I will be very proud to cast my vote. And with that, let's proceed to a vote. Uh, all those uh, in favor say aye or concur. Concur. In part. Oh. Oh. <laughs> trigger, trigger finger. All those opposed <laughs> say nay. 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 Uh, the ayes have it. I apologize for that. So ordered. The request for editorial privileges is uh, granted. Uh, and no, we haven't adjourned yet, and we will, Commissioner Baker, uh, uh, get you out of here for your plane. But um, let me first ask my colleagues if they have any announcements to make. None. Commissioner McDowell. Very quickly. Um, yeah. well, everyone's thanked their staffs. My, my team doesn't like to be thanked publicly. I get yelled at in the, uh, when I do that. So uh, for all the long hours that they've put in, for all the sick children that they've had to deal with while working, uh, for all the spouses who've been left behind, I thank them. So I'm going to honor that and not thank them. But we do have two law clerks who are leaving us. Uh, we have uh, Brooke Erickson and Tim and they've also put in very long hours uh, on this project, and we want to uh, thank them. And this may be their last day, at least for now. So thank you all very much, Brooke and Tom. Uh, 
uh, thank you. Let me just, in closing, as we bid to 2010, uh, on behalf of uh, all the commissioners, say goodbye to many members of the FCC family. Um, keeping with tradition, long-time employees will be retiring uh, this month or just at the beginning of next year. Uh, our employees are, of course, the FCC's greatest asset. Uh, each of our retirees has made an enormous contribution to this agency. Uh, together, these individuals who are retiring represent literally many centuries uh, of service, advancing the agency's mission of promoting opportunity and prosperity through communications technology. Uh, uh, I'm not going to uh, acknowledge uh, all of them uh, uh, individually. Um, I do want to mention that thanks to Mary Beth Richards and Steve Van we had a wonderful event uh, a couple of weeks ago, honored all of the 30-plus uh, year uh, uh, employees at the FCC. Uh, we had one 50-plus year employee who was honored, one 45-plus uh, employee who was honored. Um, uh, one of the things that we really have to do is uh, make sure that we uh, 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 get the oral histories of, uh, of, of the incredible people here at the agencies who have seen uh, technologies advance year, decade after decade, while the commissions, all of our predecessors and the predecessors before them wrestled with issues a lot like those we're wrestling with today. Uh, so I thank all of the retirees. I'm glad that the commission room was, uh, was packed on that day. Uh, as President Kennedy once said, the success of this government and thus the success of our nation depends upon the quality of our career public servants. Uh, it's often fashionable uh, to say the opposite, but those of us who work here understand um, uh, how hard uh, and how well the staff of the FCC works. Uh, please join me in thanking uh, all of our staff, including especially our retirees, for their service and wishing them well. And on that note, I'd like to wish everyone a safe and happy holiday season. Uh, see you in the new year. Uh, Madam Secretary, please announce the date of the next FCC meeting. The next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission is Tuesday, January 25th, 2011. And now we are adjourned.